You know you're gonna see the best of the worst with the shit flick critic. You know you're gonna see shit that's absurd with the shit flick critic. From Pandemic the Room, Samurai Cop Troll 2, Manos has a fame I need connection to. So come along, see the worst with me, I'm the shit flick critic. Greetings, my friends, and welcome to The Shit Flick Critic, with me, your host, Andrew Lewis. You're interested in the shit, the poor, the terrible. That is why you're here. And now, for the first time, I'm bringing you the full story of what happened to that fateful film. The incidents, the places, my friends, we can't keep this a secret any longer. Can your heart stand the shocking facts behind Plan 9 from Outer Space? Last night I saw a flying object that couldn't have possibly been from this planet. Your space commander has returned from Earth. What plan will you follow now? Plan 9. Plan 9 deals with the resurrection of the dead. Long distance electrodes shot into the pineal pituitary glands of recent dead. Plan 9 from Outer Space is a science fiction slash horror film directed, written, produced and edited by Edward D. Wood Jr., a man often cited as being the worst film director ever. After its release in 1959, it was only played on television in relative obscurity until 1980, when the Golden Turkey Awards dubbed it the worst film of all time. In order to understand the strange story behind Plan 9 from Outer Space, we must first understand the strange story behind its creator, Ed Wood. Edward D. Wood Jr. is a filmmaker, actor, writer, producer and director of some of the worst films ever to grace the silver screen. Born in Poughkeepsie, New York in 1924, while Edward was growing up his mother would frequently dress him in girls clothing as she had always wanted a daughter. Edward would then spend the rest of his life as a heterosexual crossdresser and be constantly obsessed with the feel of various fabrics on his skin, with Angora sweaters being a particular favourite. In 1942, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, Edward joined the military and would go on to fight in some of the deadliest battles of the Pacific Theatre. He did all this while wearing a bra and panties under his uniform, and has said that he would much rather be killed than wounded, as the medics would strip his clothes and discover his secret. After the war, Edward moved to Hollywood to pursue his dream of being a big shot director, and he got his opportunity in 1953 when he learnt of a film that was going to be made by 50s exploitation producer George Weiss concerning the sex reassignment surgery of Christine Jorgensen. Edward, feeling like he had an advantage due to his own personal insight and struggles as a crossdresser, convinced Weiss to let him write and direct the film as a way of educating the world on the topic. It was around this time that Edward was introduced to Bella Lugosi by a friend who, once a massive horror star who had portrayed the leading role in 1931's Dracula, had now been reduced to a forgotten, broke nobody suffering from a morphine addiction. The two very quickly became good friends, and Edward, seeing the predicament that his hero was going through, asked Bella to appear in his cross-dressing docudrama, now known as Glen or Glenda, for the price of $1,000. Bella was to play the role of the scientist, a mysterious man who serves no real purpose in the film other than to give nonsensical pieces of dialogue. And he delivers all of his dialogue in his thick Hungarian accent. Beware of the big green dragon that sits on your doorstep. He eats little boys. Pull the string. Dance to that. When Glen or Glenda was released in 1953, it was panned by the critics and is considered the worst of Edward's work. It's a mishmash of transvesticism, glaringly inaccurate scientific claims. Men's hats are so tight they cut off the blood flow to the head, thus cutting off the growth of hair. The homosexual, it is true, at times does adopt the clothing or the makeup of a woman to lure members of his own sex. That's not how it works. That's not how any of this works. And totally unrelated softcore porn vignettes, added by George Weiss as he felt the film was too short and needed some spice. In order to cut down on shooting costs, Edward made as much use of any stock footage he had at his disposal. And although some footage works, others just seem out of place, like the close-ups of people's ears while they're talking. If the creator had meant us to be born girls, we certainly would have been born girls. Don't ask me, I'm just here. 
Your head stopped 18 inches ago. Or the stampeding buffalo over Bella's ranting. It's also interesting that for a film that goes to such great lengths to normalise transvesticism, Edward is still very adamant about distancing transvesticism from homosexuality. The transvestite is not interested in those of their own sex. The clothing is not worn to attract the attention of their own sex. And reassuring the audience that he, himself, is not a homosexual. Glenn is not a homosexual. Glenn is a transvestite, but he is not a homosexual. Everybody got that? Bella and Edward would go on to work on another film together, Bride of the Monster, a film which also introduced Edward to Todd Johnson, who would later go on to star in Plan 9. It was while filming Bride of the Monster that Bella's addiction with morphine really began to become a problem, with Bella constantly having to halt production to have another fix. It wasn't until the Bride of the Monster was in post-production that Bella decided to seek treatment for his addiction, and is noted as the first celebrity to ever go public about a drug-related problem. While inside, Edward kept Bella up to date with all of his film project ideas, and when it was time to leave the facility, Bella was fully recovered and felt positive about the future. You're leaving the State Hospital tomorrow. Yes, I'm very happy I do, on account that I became a, a new man. I had an assignment uh, playing the star part in uh, The Google Goes West. Uh -huh. Yes, and uh, Eddie Woods Eddie would be the producer. And you're going to handle that as soon as you leave there. Surely. After Bella's release, Edward began filming test footage for his upcoming projects with Bella wearing a cape in various locations such as a suburban house and a graveyard, with no particular plot linking them. Then, on August 16, 1951, Bella Lugosi passed away of a heart attack in his Los Angeles apartment at the age of 73. Although devastated, Edward knew the best way to honour the passing of his hero would be to use the last precious pieces of film of Bella in a new movie, a movie titled Grave Robbers from Outer Space. Edward used the fact that it would be Bella Lugosi's last film as a way of attracting attention from potential actors and investors to the project, and was able to convince J. Edward Reynolds and Hugh Thomas to produce the film. Both men were ministers of the Southern Baptist Church, and Edward even had some of his cast and crew baptised to get into their good favour, with Tor Johnson having to be baptised in a swimming pool due to his size. The ministers did have some objections towards the film though, the biggest being that they thought that the title, Grave Robbers from Outer Space, was sacrilegious, so the title was changed to Plan 9 from Outer Space. Plan 9 from Outer Space tells the story of a group of aliens that, upon discovering that the Earth is developing a bomb that could eradicate the universe, endeavours to communicate with the American government to warn them of the imminent destruction. We do not want to conquer your planet, only save it. When plans 1 through 8 fail, the aliens then decide that the most logical way to get the government's attention is to descend on a small graveyard and start reanimating corpses to wreak havoc on the locals, also known as Plan 9. The biggest casting problem that Edward had to face was that with so many scenes involving Bella and so little footage available, he needed someone who looked identical to Bella to act as a stand-in. Fortunately for Edward, his wife's chiropractor, Dr. Tom Mason, bore an uncanny resemblance to Bella, despite being a foot taller and looking nothing like him. Tom Mason spends the entirety of Plan 9 with his cape conspicuously concealing his face, in a similar way that Bella had done in the past when he appeared in Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein. Due to Edward's sporadic directing techniques, he rarely ever took a second take of any shot or gave any direction to the cast, resulting in the terrible, terrible performances. You reported that your ship was viewed at the scene of your present operation. Have one of the boys take the guy and the girl back to town. I hope I never see such a sight again. That must have been who rule Bow. Duke Moore, who plays Lieutenant Harper, even tested Edward's attentiveness by recklessly waving his gun around and displaying an extreme lack of gun safety during takes, just to see if Edward would notice. He didn't. The movie begins and ends with a speech from Criswell, a TV personality and friend of Edward's well known for his bizarre predictions of the future, and was even a frequent guest on the Johnny Carson show. His strange predictions included a lightning strike that would hit Denver, Colorado, turning metal into rubber, Mass death in 1977 due to drought, cannibalism that would terrorise America in 1980, and that the Earth would be totally and completely destroyed in 1999. His introduction is treated like one of the predictions from his show, which is strange because he starts his speech very clearly in future tense. We are all interested in the future, for that is where you and I are going to spend the rest of our lives then slowly drifts into past tense and starts describing the events like they've already happened. And now for the first time, we are bringing to you 
The full story of what happened on that fateful day. The worst offender of overacting would be Dudley Manlove, who plays the alien character Eros, who it would seem despite his appearance of a man in his mid to late 40s is really only about eight years old. Because all you of Earth are idiots. Now you just hold on, Buster. No, you hold on. You see? You see? You're stupid minds. Stupid. Stupid. I'm sure that we can handle this situation maturely. Isn't that right? Mr. Poopy Pants. Some of the cast is made up of people who are living as house guests of Paul Marco, who plays Patrolman Kelton. These people include David Demering, who plays the co-pilot, and Joe Breckenridge, who plays the extremely disenthused alien leader, who it would seem had a very hard time remembering his lines. Ah oh, yes, Plan 9 deals with the resurrection of the dead. Long distance electrode shot into the pineal pituitary glands of recent dead. Eros. The Earth people are getting closer to that which we fear. Since they will not listen or respect our existence, they cannot help but believe our powers when they see their own dead walking round again, brought about by our advancement in such things. It was also Paul Marker who convinced Vampira to be in the film for a hundred dollars. Vampira had once had her own television program, but after it was cancelled she was desperate for work. She appeared in the movie under the condition that she would be given no lines, partially because she couldn't be bothered remembering them, but mostly because of Edward's awful, awful dialogue. One thing sure, Spectre Clay's dead, murdered, and somebody's responsible. Edward had a strange habit of making characters reiterate something they just said by saying whatever they just said again, again. But I can't say a word. I'm muzzled by army brass. I can't even admit I saw the thing. Future events such as these will affect you in the future. Well, they must have a reason for their visits. Visits? I would indicate visitors. This is the most fantastic story I've ever heard. And every word of it's true, too. That's the fantastic part of it. Edward's worst piece of dialogue is his explanation for his Solovenite bomb that is supposedly supposed to eradicate all of humanity and the entire universe. Edward originally got the name from the Bible and it was supposed to be Solovenite bomb, but no one else can seem to agree on the pronunciation. The Solovenite. You speak of Solovenite. Develop this Solovenite bomb. And as for how the Solovenite bomb works, well let's just say Edward ain't no nuclear physicist. I'll let Eros explain. Take a can of your gas. Say... This can of gasoline is the sun. Now, you spread a thin line of it to a ball, representing the earth. Now, the gasoline represents the sunlight, the sun particles. Here we saturate the ball with the gasoline, the sunlight. Then we put a flame to the ball. The flame will speedily travel around the earth, back along the line of gasoline to the can, or the sun itself. It will explode this source and spread to every place that gasoline, our sunlight, touches. Explode the sunlight here, gentlemen. You explode the universe. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. Out of all the things that makes Plan 9 particularly terrible, Edward's sheer lack of effort when it comes to special effects is certainly what gives it its charm. The alien spaceships that appear in the film are just miniature toys that Edward had purchased from a store, clearly being dangled in front of a backdrop with a fishing rod. And when they needed them to be on fire, they just soaked them in kerosene and lit them with a match. Whenever an alien spaceship needed to pass by any of the characters, a spotlight was simply shone in a horizontal line, while everyone overactingly trembled or fell to the floor in a manner that would make even William Shatner jealous. The graveyard scenes were clearly just shot in a soundstage with a black backdrop and a bunch of dead branches and cardboard cutouts used as tombstones, some of which actually fall over from time to time. The issue with filming the graveyard shots on a soundstage made to look like night is that all of the location graveyard shots were filmed during the day, with the intention of making them look like night a process called day for night and very common at the time. Unfortunately for Edward, he either ran out of time or budget as none of the location shots were altered in any way, leading to the hilarious result of having characters in the same scene but at different times of day. Once again, like Glen or Glenda, Plan 9 contains a great deal of stock footage, 
which Edward thought he could seamlessly edit with footage he had filmed to save money. Let's do an exercise. See if you can tell which part of the following footage is real and which is a man dressed up in a colonel outfit standing in front of a wall made to look like Sky even though his shadow is clearly visible. You guessed it was this shot, you're correct! After Plan 9, Edward's life slowly began to fall into decay. He tried to release a few more low-budget horror films, and when those failed, he turned to writing monster porn novels and scripts, which he sometimes appeared in. It was alcohol that became the biggest challenge to Edward in his later life, giving him a bloated face and a scattered mind. Any money he did make was immediately spent on another bottle of booze. He was eventually evicted from his apartment and lost all of his manuscripts, films and mementos from his directing days, right before Christmas. Then, on December the 10th, 1978, Edward died of a heart attack due to heavy alcohol abuse. He was 54 years old. It wasn't until two years after his death that he received the Golden Turkey Award for Worst Director of All Time that interest in his films swarmed across America and the world. So much so that in 1994 a film was released by Tim Burton starring Johnny Depp based on Edward's life. The film perfectly encapsulate Edward's can-do positive attitude with his extreme sheer lack of any real talent and expands on his relationship with Bella Lugosi. There is even a whole scene devoted to the making of Plan 9, which is hilarious. Cue playing, saucer! I want those two explosions and I've got to have more shots with the military. Mr. Wood, yeah? where's the cockpit, sir? You're standing in it. Plan 9 is a wonderful and charming attempt by Edward to create a sci-fi horror film. I judge shit flicks based on five categories. Plan 9 delivers a wonderful array of laughter for people of all ages. Every scene has either a quotable piece of terrible dialogue or a hilarious special effects failure. This is the kind of movie that you can watch again and again and again. For everything bad that Plan 9 is, it certainly isn't boring as every single scene has something interesting going on in it. Although Plan 9 is bursting at the seams with technical errors, it's just what makes it that much more enjoyable to watch. And what can I say, poor old Edward. He just wanted to make a movie to give people some scares, but unfortunately due to his sheer lack of talent, he ended up getting laughter instead. I give Plan 9 from Outer Space minus 5 stars, and it is certainly up there with the best of the absolute worst and shittiest films. Thank you for joining me on another episode of The Shit Flick Critic, and unfortunately this might be my last episode for a while. I'm going travelling with my girlfriend in a couple weeks. We're going to be going all the way down the west coast of America, and i got no idea what we're doing after that. I don't know if we're going to keep travelling, I don't know if I'm coming back to Vancouver or Australia, so I'm going to just have a break from these for a while, but in the meantime, please go have a look at my other... Uh, episodes, like if you haven't, subscribe if you haven't, and speaking of my subscribers, I do have something to ask you. If there are any of you out there that live on the west coast of America and you would like to meet me, uh, send me a private message with your details and I will try my hardest to come and see you because uh, I really appreciate all the support you've given me and I'd love to meet you. So, as I said, send me a private message with your details um, and that's really it. So thank you guys so much for your support and here we go. So if you'd like to see my other episodes, we got The Room, Samurai Cop, Birdemic, Troll 2, Manos Hands of Fate, food fight and then the Christmas episode dead in the middle so thank you so much for all your support sits on your doorstep. He eats little boys, puppy dog tails, and big fat snails. Beware. Take care. Beware. 
See you all later.